So welcome everyone to Psalms for Life with the inspiring teachings of Rabbi Nachman and other tzaddikim. And uh, Psalms for Life is a series of the entire Psalms, Mirza Hashem, sponsored by Esther Ella Gorovich. And may it be a source of merit for bracha, v'hatzlacha, blessing and success, good health, long life, and everything good, closeness to Hashem, closeness to the truth, Sadikim. And we thank her for sponsoring this class. Okay. And also that goes for her family as well. Okay. So today's Psalm is Psalm five. And um, what um, this is, a, is, a, is quite a fascinating Psalm. It's short, but it's fascinating. And in this Psalm, we learn, um, we learn so much about different ways to analyze and come to a fresh understanding of Psalms based on, in a large part, uh, the, the richness of Lashon HaKodesh, the, the Hebrew language, the Holy Tongue. So we are going to, um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of this psalm. I'll give me one minute to get to the page. Okay. So previously, we know, uh, previously, we know that David Hamela was pursued by his son Avshalom at the instigation of, uh, at the instigation of Ahitophel. And we discussed how, um, how corrupt Ahitophel was. And this specific psalm addresses the spiritual resonance of that corruption, what it means, as well as another corrupt character, Doeg Ha Adami, Doeg the Edomite, which we'll learn about him more in other psalms later on, but still we want to cover him in this psalm. Now, um, David is, um, is in the previous psalm chastising everyone for following alien ideas. They're not acting the way Jews should act. They're not acting according to Torah. They're not acting with Jewish values. They are pursuing David. They are lying. They are cheating and so on and so forth. Um, in this psalm, uh, David is explaining the actual uh, um, uh, reason why the revolt is so um, disturbing. It's not just they're chasing him, trying to kill him, which is horrible, but it's because the instigator, Ahitophel, who we spoke about previously, didn't just push people to embrace alien ideologies. What he did was he himself distorted and twisted the Torah. And this is a, a significant theme of this particular psalm, um, uh, Parake, Psalm 5. And the, what Ahitophel was known for, he was known for not believing in Hashem, Okay, he was he was an aide to the government. He was an important minister, but he rejected Hashem, and yet he still studied Torah, and he used Torah as a weapon. He didn't believe it, but he became proficient in it. And Rebbe Nachman not only um, saw this previously in biblical times, as well as in his own times, but he predicted it especially for the times we're living in. He describes false leaders, and this psalm deals with this. False leaders are people who twist and distort the truth. They know that there is one God, one Torah, but they reject it, okay? Some of them are atheists, it's true. Um, but in general, what they do is they take it and they twist it, which is why we have all kinds of illegitimate movements in Judaism, many of which started in coordination and in the times of not only the Jewish so-called 
Haskalah, the Jewish so-called enlightenment, but in the so-called enlightenment of the world, when everybody, Jew and non-Jew, went to throw off the yoke of Hashem. They don't want anybody over them. And Ahitofa is um, discussed at great length, actually, in the Talmud, along with Doeg, the Edomite who I spoke about, as um, someone who asked who posed false questions to show his scholarship and dedication, uh, which reminds us of Esau in the Midrash, who asked his father, oh, how does one tithe salt? Oh, how does one tithe straw? Pretending to be so interested in giving tzedakah and giving charity and tithes when we, know, we don't tithe salt or straw. That's not what we tithe. So this kind of, Ace of consciousness, okay, Ace of is Esau in English, this Ace of consciousness, okay, of false leaders. And today, this, again, would be represented by the movements that bend and twist the Torah. And so you can pick and choose what you want to believe. Far better to struggle with the Torah as it is, by Torah I mean all Jewish literature, wisdom, halacha, laws, everything, better to struggle with it and say, I'm not there yet, I'm working on it, but I know this is the truth, than to twist it to sort our own desires, which is what the, this ace of consciousness in terms of Ahitophel was doing. Okay, ace of eventually just left, but Ahitophel, this is what he was doing. And ace of's branch, of uh, disrupted and distorted thought became um, became uh, a Greek, a Greek um, approach, um, the Greek philosophies, which a lot of West, the Western world is still founded on, as well as Christianity. Okay, and these two things distort the Torah. Okay, so anyway, um, this psalm is. Uh, it begins like this. So again, we get that word, which is for the conductor. We discussed last week. It also is etymologically related to netzach, to victory, and to something eternal. And this next word, el hanchilos, okay, nechilos is the word nachalos or nachalot, okay? And that is a legacy, an inheritance, an eternal heritance, okay? And that inheritance, I want to find my, uh, my notes because it's important. That inheritance is something that's rejected by the negative characters David addresses in this psalm, the false leaders. They take the inheritance and they twist it and they change it. They want to control the inheritance. What is the eternal inheritance? It's Torah. Simple. It's Torah. Hashem gives us the Torah. And, and again, I know I've defined this a few times, but I still get questions. So I want to make sure I'm really clear. Torah means all of authentic Judaism. Okay. Everything in authentic Judaism. We're not just talking about the five books of Moses. Okay. So this idea is, is that, is that this, this, this distortion of what our inheritance is, is a rejection of Hashem. Okay. This twisting of our inheritance. Now, I'm not just speaking about Ahitophel and Doeg and the people who pursued uh, David Hamelech. I'm also speaking about even us, okay? Even us. If we aren't committed to the idea of the eternality, the eternal nature of our nachalos, our inheritance, and the fact that this is the only true victory, which we discussed last week, if we're not committed to this idea of total determination, determinism only from Hashem, not from, not from us, it's not determinism of nature, and, and, and it's not determinism of any other factor, politic, only Hashem, we have embraced this determinism far better 
to embrace this kind of only this kind of legacy and determinism from Hashem and to admit that we're not all there yet, but we know that's the truth, then to go off in other directions. Okay. And today the pull is so easy, no matter what community you hail from, the pull is so easy. The, um, the Sitra Akra, the other side has entered into all our communities. Okay. Hold on one second, please. Sorry, there was a disturbance. Okay. So anyway, I want to discuss this word Nihilos, because we have so much richness from this one word, but I do want to cover other verses as well. So I'm going to move this along a little bit. So uh, Rav Hirsch, who really just is so delicious when it comes to these etymologies, says that um, this El Hanichilos uh, denotes not only the receipt of an inheritance or a permanent acquisition, uh, but and also of, of a real inheritance, meaning material, as well as a spiritual inheritance, but also it's used in reference to destiny or fate, okay? And he proves this from various sources. We're not going to go into them now. And that this is this word can flex depending on who's reading this psalm. So for you and me, the inheritance is the spiritual destiny, the spiritual fate that we embrace. We know that it's from Hashem. For someone else who the psalm addresses, who are the false leaders, they make their choice about what their spiritual inheritance is. They're granted autonomy to decide. And that is always going to be less than the inheritance from Hashem, that spiritual inheritance. Because what we can conceive of as human beings is quite limited. Okay. Also, uh, Rav Hirsch also speaks about this word, uh, nihilos, and he describes it. He's, he's famously quoted um, all over the place from this. Um, he references the Talmud, which explains that this word denotes, as we're referring to, a swarm of bees that has flown out from its hive looking for its colony, looking to go back and find its, its place, okay? So the idea is, is that this is also this word denotes the buzzing of bees as well as the swarm of bees, which Rav Hirsch describes as a stream or a current of bees. And therefore, he interprets this as the currents and trends of the day, as well as throughout history. And we have this idea that we have flown from our colony and our holy destiny to pursue, God forbid, currents and trends of the day. And we are pulled by whatever bees are pulled by pheromones, scents, and whatever. We're pulled by tithes to all these different opportunities for destinies. And we're forgetting our inheritance. Okay. Now, and it's interesting because if you think about a hive and you think about the queen bee, what comes to mind for me immediately is the Shekhinah. Okay. That inheritance of revealing Hashem in this world. And when Mashiach comes, having the the Shekhinah and that Shekhinah energy being the dominant energy, okay, which is such holiness. So this idea is also um, relevant to other translations, which call the Nihilos a type of instrument, a musical instrument, and some call it melodies. Some translations refer to Nihilos as types of melodies. So this does reference bees in that Rav Hirsch points out that this buzzing sound that bees make actually could be um, referring to melodies and instruments. And in other sources say that the instrument called Hanahilos, okay, the one that was being played actually sounded like bzzz, oh, like a kind of buzzing, swarming sound, a bee sound. Okay, there are a lot of ways to look at this world. It's this word, it's so rich that I had to stop and pause for 
for the this this word. Okay, now um, we're going to go. We're going to skip to uh, Zion uh, to uh, uh, verse seven. Okay, and um, actually before that we have um, verse six, which I'll briefly read. Resha atalo yegurcha ra. Okay, and that is the roister roisterers or um, not good ones. It really means lawless ones. Ones who throw off the law may not stand firm before your eyes. Okay. And um, lo yis yatsvu, I didn't, I actually didn't complete the verse. They wouldn't stand, they wouldn't be strong. Holim leneged enecha senesa kol poale oven. So like I said, they wouldn't stand strong before your eyes. So he's speaking to Hashem. And in between the two verses, the opening verse and this verse is he's telling Hashem, you know, help me, listen to me and so on and so forth. And he's discussing, he's reminding Hashem, so to speak, that all these negative false people, they have no foundation to stand on. That's what he's saying here. And in verse seven, which is what I really want to get to, he says, to Abe Dovre Kazav, Ish Damin Umirma. Okay. He says um, this idea that um, you will doom the, the speakers of falsehood and the, um, this, uh, this bloodthirsty man. Okay, so what is this idea? He's going to destroy, he's asking Hashem to destroy these people. We know Hashem eventually will destroy this energy. Okay, Every, even these people have opportunities to do tshuva and to take, take up whatever their inherent, in, inheritance is, whether it is toward Judaism or some version of the Noahide laws. Okay, everybody has this opportunity. Okay, we all have varying degrees of free will to choose, but if not, they will be doomed, they will be destroyed. And this idea is, is that, is that these people are deceitful, they're liars. Okay, so what is this idea of a liar versus a truth teller? So here is where Rabbi Nachman comes in. Rabbi Nachman asks us, he encourages us. He challenges us to examine ourselves for whether or not we're truthful. And he says, and he says very clearly, there really is only one truth. And today we are being challenged in the ways that Rebbe Nachman alluded to with this idea of something called moral relativity. What is moral relativity? It means that if somebody grew up as a cannibal, that's their culture. So therefore, cannibalism is okay for them. Okay. So this idea really began to be introduced a couple hundred years ago with the Enlightenment, but really became prevalent in the 1960s and 70s. Okay. And that movement was rooted in the communist movement, this idea to throw off the yoke of Hashem and embrace anything goes. I gave that example. There are many more examples. Perhaps the most pernicious example of soul-destroying ideologies that are false are the ideologies of um, of. Uh, a sexual nature today. It's very, very damaging to people's neshamas. And everybody knows what I'm talking about. And this idea that we can reject our inheritance and still be fine and still be truthful is impossible, says Rebbe Nachman. He's very clear. He says like this. He says a silver cup, you have a silver kiddush cup, right? A silver cup is a silver cup. You might call it gold. You might call it copper or something else, but it remains a silver cup, okay? That's the truth. There's only one truth. Now, we are so permeated with this idea of shades of gray that we reject this on its surface because we want, we're, we're good people, all of us here, I know that. And we all want to embrace people who, 
maybe they have a slightly different idea than us, but we want we don't want them to feel bad and we want them to embrace them, embrace them. Still, Rebbe Nachman says, there's only one truth. There's Torah and Hashem, and that's it. Now, within Torah, this is where people confuse the idea of the shades of gray along with streams of halachic acceptable Torah viewpoints. Within Torah, there are different flavors. Okay, so you go into an ice cream shop, and there are 120 flavors of ice cream, and they're all made out of cream and milk and sugar and whatever. And then they have in the corner something called avocado ice cream, which is just made out of frozen avocado and it's vegan and it might even be delicious, but they call it ice cream. It's not ice cream. The flavors, the pistachio, the chocolate chip, the strawberry, those are all ice cream. Okay. So within Torah, we have many streams and paths that are authentic and legit as long as they pass muster, as long as they reference truth, as long as they hold truth. So for each of us, Rebbe Nachman does something in some ways unheard of and brilliant, yet it still is something that's referenced subtly by other tzaddikim, but this idea of not only our personal autonomy and ability to choose, but the personal needs of our individual souls. And so speakers of deception who are going to be doomed, okay, the people who, who are after blood, who are deceitful, okay, that Hashem hates, that the Psalm just says to us, Hashem hates those people, okay, but still within our own way we can cling to truth follow truth find our place in truth okay shun those lies and still be able to express ourselves and be true to ourselves it's it's subtle and it's revolutionary in some ways because we have been persecuted and chased for so long, we've been exiled for so long and we're still in exile, okay? But this exile is a very subtle, okay? Very deceitful, untruthful exile. The previous exiles, you knew who your enemies were. They were coming to get you with, you know, with guns and clubs and swords and all that kind of stuff. Here, the, the exile is more, uh, more spiritual and therefore more hidden. They're coming to co corrupt us. They're coming to corrupt our viewpoints. They're coming to corrupt our attachment to Hashem. They're coming to pull us away from truth. And therefore, this psalm is extremely relevant today because this isn't just enemies that are coming to hit us with clubs and hammers. And the, the, the thing is also, okay, and the thing is also is that we have these enemies now inside us. We've been vaccinated with them, if you want to call it that, okay? We now have taken in so much from the world at large and world philosophies that it becomes difficult for us to discern truth. Everybody goes through this. So we still have to cling even more and more tightly to this idea of authentic Torah truth, authentic tzaddikim, Okay, who's authentic, not who I feel is authentic, but who generally is an upright Torah person who has been given the stamp of authenticity by other upright Torah people, people who embrace Torah. We have to follow those people because if we follow the deceitful people, we're going to end up losing our legacy, forfeiting our legacy, much in the same way that Asaph did. And that's really the trick of that kind of consciousness. So we have a, a battle with the world. How much are we taking in? Okay, what are we taking in? How is it, how is it tainting us? How is it affecting us? How is it changing us? So hard today because we, everybody naturally feels that their point of view is plain vanilla. And that everybody else's point of view who disagrees with them is biased. And we have to step outside our, oh, everybody does, our own point of view to take a good hard look at it. 
if you're if you're very blessed, your point of view is going to really align with Torah. You're doing a good job hanging there. If you're like most of humanity, there are going to be struggles in this area for anybody, anybody who didn't grow up in with a good, strong Jewish background. OK, uh, myself included. OK, we had to really do a lot of hard work to not only learn about Torah and what it means to be a Jew and so on, but what it means for us internally. How do we align our insides with our outsides and our outsides with our insides, to be fair? So this psalm addresses truth and untruth, and it addresses the people like Ahitophel and Doeg who are trying to uproot, um, uproot us in the most devious way possible, which is pretending to offer Torah, pretending to be one of those trendy movements that arose in the past 100 and 200 years, pretend to be Judaism. They pretend to, pretend to be Judaism. This is the most insidious. And is it still going on today? And can we even find it in people who really are doing their best to live a Torah observant life. Yes, we even find it in observant communities. We find these streams that, that, that make us confused. We have to turn to Hashem alone. We have to turn to the tzaddikim alone. We have to turn to uh, rabbis and mentors who are absolutely wed to this idea of our nachalos our inheritance, our legacy, what that means, because it's an eternal legacy promised to us by Hashem. It's the Torah and everything that that embodies. Okay, I want to um, at least do another verse. Okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. okay. I think, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to those verses. Let's see what I can do. Hang in there, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is also, I think this verse is really worth delving into. Let's go to this idea of that's um, represented in verse 10. And I'm also going to reference both Rav Hirsch and Rabbein Rebbe Nachman. Okay. Oh, and one more thing I want to say. Ahitopo and Doe didn't have a Rebbe. A Rebbe meaning a teacher and a guide. They did, they rejected rabbis, they rejected the law, they rejected having anyone, anyone having any authority over what they did and who they were. And this rejection of authority, of Torah authority, I'm not talking about somebody coming into your home and telling you, you know, you have to rewash your dishes, they're crusty. I'm talking about real authority, you know, like, oh, you have a question about this halach and you, oh, you have a question about which direction to go in. They rejected all of that. And we find this, it's so interesting. We find this in America today. On the one hand, America, I'm specifically speaking about the United States, offers us tremendous, tremendous, tremendous freedom and autonomy to be what we want to be. And that's wonderful, especially wonderful for anyone who wants to, 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 to really live a Jewish life. It's wonderful, so much freedom, so much good. On the other hand, the, the, the sort of ethos is to reject authority and to throw out the baby with the bathwater, okay? To be renegades against even Torah authority. It's a tightrope walk. It's very interesting. It's for good and for not good. Okay, so let's do briefly verse 10, okay? Um, with Rav Hirsch, I think we're going to do. Okay. So he says like this. Okay. Um, uh, so the Psalm says like this. Okay. Give me one second, please. Okay. Ki ein befihu nechona kirbam havos kever pasuach geronam. Okay. Um, what does that mean? For in their befihu, in their mouth, 
Okay, there's no sincerity, no truthfulness, and their inner thoughts are treacherous. Okay, now it's interesting because in this verse, um, Rav Hirsch identifies something important. And what he identifies is this idea of havos, okay, to become, okay. So he identifies this idea that I, that I said that they're becoming, and in that becoming with that verse, which is like this infinitive form, it means that their spirit is constantly scheming, they're plotting, they're planning. They're scheming, they're manipulating. They're always, they can't rest. They always have to work towards treachery. They're driven towards treachery. What came first, the lies or the treachery or the treachery or the lies? What came first is someone who struggles with hurt, anger, frustration, and instead of turning towards Hashem, and turning to their Rebbe, their teacher, their mentor, they turn away and they turn towards the news, <laughs> okay, the um, non-Jewish philosophers and philosophies, politics, uh, science, so-called, they turn towards anything that allows them to have their thoughts go in a direction that isn't restrained by morals, laws, orders. And unfortunately, through that, they give up their inheritance. And these are the people and the forces that pursued David Hamelach his whole life. Okay. Specifically here, when we speak about um, we've been speaking about his pursuit by his son and, uh, son in the last couple of psalms. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do our, our daily reading. Um, there's so much more. I highly, highly encourage you to, even the simple meaning of this psalm is just really so um, powerful, so, um, so um, relevant to us personally and to our our situation at large. So that's what I'm going to do. Esther Ella asked, what is the Segula? So I'm going to go over the Segulas for this psalm and for today's psalms. I'm going to tell you what they are. So I, I've been trying to do the Segula first, but I wanted to wait till we heard the whole thing. Because the Segula for this psalm is that it's a Segula against evil forces, demons, evil energy, evil spirits. Okay. And however you want to view those things, if you have some Talmudic knowledge or some knowledge of the Zohar and so forth, you have one way of understanding them. The idea is, is that we can shake off that negative stuff, okay, through following the truth and turning to Hashem. And this psalm is explicitly explaining to us, focus on your inheritance. If you knew you were going to inherit $100 million, why would you trade it all for $100,000? Okay, that's the idea. Okay, now, today's is the 20th of Kislev. It's almost Hanukkah. And the Psalms that we're going to read, we're going to start reading Psalm 5, okay? And then we're going to all read together. Um, I have somebody has a question. Okay. Um, okay, do we have time for a question? Uh, does, I, I guess we'll, have, we'll ask uh, a question. When someone has been subjected to a form persecution from without having been subjected to trauma, then turns from living a true Torah life. What words do we use to speak and encourage them with? How do we daven for them to overcome their pain and perhaps twisted perception of Hashem and Torah to realign themselves with his will? Excellent question. We should do a whole class on it. Okay. But certainly davening for that person with words from the heart, speaking to Hashem and his, his bodhidus and the heat dude, and also saying, Tehillim. Remember, all Tehillim bring about all kinds of salvation. 
If you find, if, if you want to reject that dark energy, that ace of consciousness, and you're davening for someone to reject that, whether it's you or someone else, okay, then any song is a school for that. Really, I'm giving you specific ones because it is interesting to say them and they do have relevance, but all Psalms contain Yeshua salvations. We should say as many Psalms as we can. Sometimes people are busy on the week, but they say the whole book of Psalms on Shabbos, okay? Whatever it is, Tikkun HaKlali also, very important. If you can say those 10 Psalms, you can say them for someone else, okay? And maybe we could do a class on it. We can talk about that. Okay, now today's Psalms are 97 through 103. Okay, and um, I'm going to give you the Segulas. If you want, you can write them down. You can, you can even make a note in a book of Tehillim as long as it's in the margin and you're not covering any letters. Okay, some people like to do that. I prefer the little post-it and can see all my, um, what are these things here? Uh, the tabs. Okay. 97 is a psalm to Dobbin for a happy family. 98, important, important, to Dobbin for peace between people, whether it's peace between people you know, family situations, we see this all the time, or for peace between you and another person, okay? 99, um, help in coming closer to Hashem, becoming more connected to Torah. If somebody wants you know, you know, Naomi asked this in the chat, which was about somebody who's, you know, struggling with that. Um, you could dive in this psalm for them, okay? 100, uh, two things, easy birth and success against enemies. And so if labor pains are enemies, we've got them both covered. Okay, Psalm 101, how to, a psalm to help us act righteously towards Hashem to be mentions towards Hashem, to have kavod, honor for Hashem, okay? To respect him, to understand that he has wishes for us, okay? It's a, it's a, it's a certain aspect of that relationship. Psalm 102, uh, for people who need help having children, okay? There's, they don't have children or they, they have secondary infertility, whatever it is daven for them, okay? Use this psalm. You could daven for yourself as well. And also it's a general psalm for help during difficult times. 103, same in terms of children. Okay, so we're going to start with Psalm 5, and then we're going to say 97 through 103. And I would like to add that um, you can, if you want us to keep in mind people for Rafua Shlema, please type it in the message box. And I'm going, I can't type it in because um, my keyboard's over there and I can't reach it, but Avraham Yehoshua Ben Esther Malka, please keep him in mind. That's Rabbi Greenbaum, who's just in recovering from surgery, okay? And please feel free to type in names that you want us to keep in mind for Rafua Shlema. Okay, so we're gonna start with Psalm five and then do 97 through 103 and we'll have done today's Psalms, okay. Avraham Yehoshua Ben Esther Malka, Ella Gurevich, Esther Ella, Batya Batmania. She should have a refuish lema and a long life. Okay, please feel free to type the names and everybody just take a peek at them and keep them in mind. Okay, we're going to start. 